Good morning. We come in our daily Bible reading to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Of course, this is going to mark the end of our study and read through of 1 Corinthians. As you think about how Paul's wrapping up this letter, he has spoken to a people he addressed in chapter 1 as the church of God. And while they were marked with the division, they were absolutely still a collective group of Christians serving God. And this is a powerful example to us that as we look at the book of 1 Corinthians, we can see all kinds of problems that they had and misunderstandings. But we need to always remember that this was absolutely a church of God, a church that belonged to Christ. And while there's so many good passages to look at to be encouraging, sometimes we focus on the negative and realize that they, like us, are people. And the good news is that they, like us, have a God who is forgiving, willing to hear them out, and willing to allow them to come to repentance. As we read 1 Corinthians chapter 16, let's be thankful to God every day that we have a chance to serve Him, a chance to be forgiven if we confess and repent, and realize how wonderful it is to just be able to read the words of God. I hope you'll read with me in verse 1 of chapter 16. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so you also are to do. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper, so that there will be no collecting when I come. And when I arrive, I will send those whom you credit by letter to carry your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable that I should go also, they will accompany me. So, of course, Paul talks about the collection here in verse 1, the collection for the saints. And this is something that a lot of churches were involved in. And so he is going to collect this, but notice his instructions in verse 2. For this need that they were raising a collection for, on the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper, so there will be no collecting when I come. Now, verse 2 is important for us because it shows us a pattern of how needs were met in the first century. There was a collection from the individual saints to a collective pile or treasury, we might say, to take care of a need. Now, this gift was going to Jerusalem, but notice how they were to give on the first day of every week, and they were to lay something aside as they had prospered. Now, just to remember this in 1 Corinthians, we're, we don't see a huge emphasis on the collection, but in the book of 2 Corinthians, we are going to see that. And as wonderful as it was that Israel was God's covenant people under the law of Moses and in that first covenant, how much greater is our covenant that we can be Christians, that we have a mediator in Christ Jesus, that we don't need to offer those animal sacrifices continually? And if we keep that in mind, the amount that we give, how we view our things as ours or God's, rather that it's something that I am a steward over that God has blessed me with, should be determined by how thankful we are for his blessings. And that is that we have a new and better covenant. We should be willing to give more and be more thankful than the Israelites would have been obligated to give under the law of Moses. So just some words for our consideration that we should give bountifully. That is, if you sow bountifully, we'll learn in 2 Corinthians, you should reap bountifully. And so how do we give on the first day of the week as we have prospered? So we come to verse 5. I will visit you after passing through Macedonia. For I intend to pass through Macedonia, and perhaps I will stay with you or even spend the winter, so that you may help me on my journey wherever I go. For I do not want to see you now just in passing. I hope to spend some time with you, if the Lord permits. But I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost, for a wide door for effective work is open to me, and there are many adversaries. When Timothy comes, see that you put him at ease among you, for he is doing the work for the Lord as I am. So let no one despise him. Help him on his way in peace, that he may return to me, for I am expecting him with the brothers. I think you learn a lot about Paul and his love for brethren here. Notice what he says in verse 7. I don't want to see you just in passing. I want to spend real time with you. In the first century, Christians really emphasized spending time with one another, or at the very least, the apostles like Paul that we can track valued spending real quality time with their brethren. I wonder sometimes if I'm as good at that as Paul would have been, or if I care as much about that as Paul did. It should be a challenge for us to always remember that if we want to be like the first century church, and we like to say that we want to be a church just like those in the first century, those in the New Testament, we need to make sure that we value spending time with Christians, whether you're Christians here or Christians afar, maybe traveling evangelists or whoever we may have an opportunity to spend time with. But also notice how Paul's decisions are dictated. There's two different phrases he uses that are good examples for us in our daily life. One of them is, I want to spend a lot of time with you, but doing so on what condition at the end of verse 7? if the Lord permits. Now, there's a lot to that. Maybe he was being divinely guided, and, and we don't necessarily know how Paul would understand that, but we need to make sure that everything we think, say, and do is according to this phrase, if the Lord permits. That we'll spend time with people that will do things and will serve here or serve there as the Lord wills or as the Lord permits. We need to make sure God comes first in every decision tree that we have. But also notice what he says in verse 9. I'm going to stay in Ephesus, verse 8, 
because a wide door for effective work is open to me. Now, you think about that and we say, wow, there's a lot of opportunity. This must be a really good moment, a really good city. And notice what the end of verse 9 says. There's going to be a lot or many adversaries. Now, I understand that there could be a lot of potential souls in an area that also, aside from that, have adversaries. But I, I know for me, selfishly, if I'm looking at a way to serve God, I want it to be as easy or smooth as possible. I don't really think of a, a great chance to serve God as being one filled with adversaries. But Paul does. Because Paul cares about the souls either of the adversaries and or of those others who the adversaries could be around and infecting. We need to make sure that we take every opportunity we can to serve God and to please him. Giving not only of our financial resources, but of our bodies and time. We need to make sure that we're devoting every effort we have, every thought, every gift that God has given us to serving him, whether it's inconvenient or very convenient. Whether it looks like that we're going to win a lot of souls or whether we're going to win one soul. Because after all, we just need to do the planting. God will water. God will provide the increase. We just need to sow the seed. It is God's message. It's the seed. It's God who takes care of the salvation. But I need to do my part to make sure I'm sowing that seed. In verse 12, Now concerning our brother Apollos, I strongly urged him to visit you with the other brothers. But it was not at his will to come now. He will come when he has opportunity. Be watchful. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. Now I urge you, brothers, you know that the household of Stephanus were the first converts in Achaia, and that they have devoted themselves to the servants of the saints. Be subject to such as these, and to every fellow worker and laborer. I rejoice at the coming of Stephanus, and Fortunatus, and Achaicus, because they have made up for your absence, for they refreshed my spirit as well as yours. Give recognition to such people. Now we're going to work in reverse here. In verse 18, notice that they have refreshed my spirit as well as yours. And what does Paul say to do? Give recognition to such people. He rejoices at their coming. Now we need to make sure that when people serve us, when they're encouragement, we need to be encouragers. Barnabas in Acts chapter 4 is a son of encouragement. But when someone does something for you in a church family or maybe even in the world, but especially in the church family, make sure that you show your gratitude. I need to make sure that when someone helps me out, I let them know. It's encouraging, and we can make a cycle of encouragement that might uplift me to help serve someone else if I know just how much it means to them. If you've ever known someone who was shut in, if you've ever been shut in, you realize just how much one phone call can mean. Just one card saying, I'm thinking of you. I love you. I still want a connection with you. Just how impactful that can be. And when someone tells you that, you remember. When someone looks at you and says, I thought I was forgotten. I'm so thankful that you reached out. We remember. Let's make sure we show our gratitude to others. One, that they know that they're loved and appreciated. But two, to encourage them to continue serving God and serving others with the wonderful example they're already laying down. Now, of course, as we go back to verse 13, Paul says, be watchful. Well, from a scriptural standpoint, being watchful is important. Watch for wolves. Wolves in sheep clothing. Watch out for wolves themselves. Watch out for adversaries. Be alert. Be sober-minded. The devil prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, Peter would write in 1 Peter chapter 5. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. Be strong. Stand firm. The storms of life are going to come, but if your foundation is Jesus, as Paul writes about in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we don't have to worry about anything. Because we're not living for this life. Remember, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we're living for that imperishable body that does not see corruption or decay. We're living for God. And so in verse 14, even though we're going to stand strong, we're going to keep the wolves at bay, keep the devil at bay, make sure we're motivated what? Let all that you do be done in love. This reminds us a lot of, frankly, a lot of 1 Corinthians. Whether it's sacrificing my liberties for others, that's a loving sacrifice. Or 1 Corinthians chapter 13, what love is? That love is patient and kind. And you think about the fact the first three verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul says, even if you do everything, even if I, verse 3, deliver my body up to be burned, if I have not love, it's not worth anything. Stand firm, yes. Keep the wolves at bay. Don't let the adversaries win. Stand up for your soul and the souls of your brethren. But let all things be done with love. It's not a contest. It's not a good works accumulation process. It's about loving God and loving others. So in verse 19, the churches of Asia send you greetings, Aquila and Prissa, together with the church in their house, send your hearty greetings in the Lord. All the brothers send you greetings. Greet one another with a holy kiss. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. If anyone has no love for the Lord, let him be accursed. Our Lord come. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. Paul loved his brethren. He loved the people. And everyone deserves to be encouraged. If anyone has lo no love for the Lord, let him be accursed. Our Lord come. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. Love Jesus. 
Know that he was resurrected. Know that the grace is there for you. We can be enveloped in it. We can stand in the great grace of God. But we have to submit to him. We have to trust in him. And as we studied yesterday, let's always remember, because Jesus lives, we can live too. Let's encourage one another. Let's make sure that we, we stay encouraged to do what God says always and please him. And may God always be praised, glorified, and thanked the way he deserves as our creator and maker. I hope you join us tomorrow as we study a new book, 2 Corinthians chapter 1.